Nancy Wong. I'm from the University of Washington. Uh, unfortunately, I'm unable to attend AAAI this year, uh, but I hope that this pre-recorded presentation will do a good enough job of explaining our paper on multimodal deep learning for natural human neural recordings and video. Uh, to start, I'd like to tell a little story about how uh, I got into this field. Um, I was always very impressed by the amazing brain-computer interface research uh, that has really come a long ways in the past few years. For example, um, a few years ago, uh, Kathy here was able to, for the first time, uh, use her uh, brain to control a robotic arm to drink uh, from a bottle of water, which is something that she hasn't done for a long time. Uh, <clears throat> and. As, um, as amazing as I thought this was, it also got me thinking about a couple of um, questions. Firstly, uh, what about uncontrolled environments? This is in a very well-controlled laboratory setting. Um, everything was prepared just for this experiment. Would Kathy be able to take her device home with her and be able to perform tasks as she has done in this demonstration? And secondly, um, I, I bet, as you and I all know as researchers, there's a lot of work that goes into every kind of uh, research experiment, and a lot of it is manual. So in this case, there was probably a lot of fine-tuning that was done. So can we, how can we automate as much of this uh, research and setting up for each individual subject uh, as much as possible? Uh, to tackle these questions, uh, the uh, I um, wanted to go more of a naturalistic route. So we were able to have access to this amazing set of data. Uh, there are naturalistic recordings of video, audio, and neural data of patients from hospital undergoing epilepsy monitoring. So uh, I have a slightly gruesome picture coming up, so look away if you don't like blood. Um, in in this, uh, the neural recording that I was talking about is uh, invasive in the sense that it's uh, electrodes that are implanted on the uh, above the scalp, but they're not penetrating. Uh, so they're less invasive than some other methods that you may know about. And the patients who are in the hospital are doing all kinds of natural things um, because they're there for a whole week. So they're doing things that you and I would, for example, eat or drink or sometimes even argue with their spouses watching TV, so all kinds of interesting behavior that we can look at. So we have all this data, audio, video, and even neurodata. The question is, how can we turn all this hours and hours and hours of data into something meaningful? Like, for example, what are the areas of speech in this person's brain? So that's the question that we want to tackle with uh, automation and machine learning and data science. Uh, so to tell a little more about the data, we have um, day and night videos, 24-7 of the patients. They're usually there for about a week. Um, and the electrocorticography, or the electrodes that are implanted on the surface of the brain, they range from 64 to 104 electrodes per patient, and they're kilohertz in sampling, the in sampling rate. The video monitoring um, are, is in RGB and infrared and the audio monitoring is in, uh, and we have audio monitoring so we can hear everything that the patients are saying uh, to their providers or to their family members. Um, and we also, for some of the patients, have a depth stream. So we have a Kinect camera in there as well. So all together, it's a lot of data, 150 gigs a day, uh, a lot to do with, deal with. Uh, in our first uh, paper on this uh, that was published uh, a couple years ago, we um, are able. To, we were able to automatically extract kind of uh, rough times of speech and movement. Um, as you can see here, um, we have six subjects. Each row is one day of, of the subject's life in the hospital, from 8 a.m. to 8 a.m. the next day. And you can see that they are more active during the day and um, kind of go to sleep, sleep where there isn't really that much activity at night, which makes sense. So all this is automatically extracted, and once we have the behavior, we're able to, we're able to look at um, uh, the electrocorticography or the neural data. Um, in this case, we're, we um, use hierarchical clustering to uh, 
in an unsupervised way cluster the neurodata. And you can see that there are very interesting split offs. Um, so, for example, you might notice an interesting um, change at around 11 a.m. and around 10 p.m. Uh, with this gray cluster uh, increasing in. Uh, in, in, increasing in occurrence. So it turns out that those are the times when a patient was sleeping or taking a nap. Um, and we can go further down the hierarchy and pick out times like movement and speech. And the reason we're able to tell what these clusters are is because we're able to correlate those in time with the uh, movement and uh, audio detection that I showed earlier from the video. So this is a way of combining different modalities to, in a completely unsupervised way without any manual coding, uh, to figure out what the patients um, are doing. Um, and, but we can do way better. Um, although in the previous um, uh, study, we were able to do cool things like functionally map the brain without any kind of uh, labeling. We wanted to do something more detailed, like, for example, actually be able to pick out the uh, movement trajectories or movement initiation of specifically the wrist, for example, or the elbow. And uh, we worked for a while on adapting pose recognition algorithms to our specific data set. And we're finally able to do it, as shown here in this demonstration. Um, so one of so the first question we want to tackle, as outlined in this paper, is can we decode or even predict future movement initiation? So given the data from the video and the ECOG uh, of 100 milliseconds, a, a thousand milliseconds before someone actually moves or doesn't move, can we actually predict the future, uh, their future behavior? Uh, to do this, we had a um, multimodal. Uh, Multimodal deep learning uh, neural network that had uh, two that had two inputs: the video um, and the uh, raw ECOG signal. Uh, in the the ECOG signal is actually quite different to how people usually approach it. Um, researchers generally turn it into some kind of using some kind of um, frequency transformation, uh, like Fourier transforms, um, to get into a frequency basis. But in our case, we thought that a convolutional neural network is already looking, can look at um, the signal uh, in time. So we decided to feed in the raw data. And the video is using standard convolutional neural network uh, networks for uh, image data. And altogether, um, after we merged the layers, we uh, put it through an LSTM of with a sequence of five different of, of five um, frames uh, in time, in order to predict uh, whether there is future movement or not. Um, and here are the uh, the network architecture for um, movement for the um, video and the ECOG, and you can see more of this detail in the paper. Uh, uh, coming up with the looking at the results, uh, we find that when compared to traditional methods using spectral features with SVM, uh, our deep learning uh, method does way better at predicting whether there will be future movement or not. And in addition, um, looking using multimodal, so using the video data as well as the ECOG data, is better than any of the single modality networks. Uh, and we think that this might be using context. For example, although the ECOG or the neural data is really what drives our future behavior, the video, for example, whether it's dark or bright or what kind of items are around, can help uh, figure out what the future, it can, can help give context to the ECOG data that we have. Um, as well, we wanted to interpret our results and look at some insights that we may be able to get from the deep learning. And you can see here that we're looking at different convolutional levels um, of the ECOG data. So the, uh, the uh, y-axis is electrode channel, and x-axis is time. And these are sample um, neurons from the network. Um, that, and what we're showing is the maximally stimulating input for that neuron. And for the first couple levels, you see kind of um, 
uh, repeated patterns in time, maybe somewhat similar to uh, Gabor filters in uh, the uh, visual sense. sense. Um, and then when you go further down uh, the hierarchy, you could see that it's in um, the patterns become more abstract and perhaps more interesting and dynamic over time. We're not exactly sure what this means yet, but I think it's interesting that it it's similar to Fourier uh, bases, which is what researchers have always used to deal with this kind of data. But at the same time, it's perhaps finding more interesting features than straight um, frequency bands. Additionally, we uh, did an ablation test on the data to see which of the electrodes from uh, which electrodes mattered most when it comes to figuring out if someone's going to move in the future or not. And thankfully, we were able to find that the sensory motor region, which has been found in previous literature, is what's driving most of the um, most of the prediction results. Uh, however, what's even more interesting is that compared to the regular just ECOG single modality neural network, the multimodal neural network actually has less an ablation impact, so it's still able to stay relatively accurate, uh, whereas the single neural network, single ECOG neural network, um, has a very large decrease in accuracy when we ablate those important electrodes. So somehow, perhaps the video was able to compensate for this um, ablation. Uh, finally, I'm really excited to announce that we are releasing the data that we used for this uh, for for this paper. Uh, one of the unfortunate things about uh, ECOG research is that the data is very, very rare, um, obviously because of the patient privacy and there are very few patients who undergo this kind of procedure. Um, and for the first time, because we're able to use computer vision to automatically extract labels, we're able to get hundreds of hours of recording that can be analyzed, uh, whereas in the past there have been very few there have been very few research on this, uh, a few research on very long-term uh, uh, data, uh, ECOG data. Uh, if you're interested, please go on bingbrenton.com slash data for requests for access. Uh, we'd love to see what people do with this, like I said, hundreds of hours and millions of frames of data, of neurodata plus um, uh, joint coordinates. Finally, um, I'd like to thank you and all of my advisors and co-authors for all their help um, in, this uh, in, in this research, and uh, of course the funders as well. Uh, again, I'm just, I apologize for not being able to be there, but if you uh, have any questions, please email uh, wongnxr at uw.edu. Um, I'd love to hear from how you uh, hear any feedback or any questions that you may have. Thank you very much.